Hello and welcome back to the video series. I am so sorry it's taken me so long to get to this point between the holidays and then a number of new technology trainings and one certification that I had to get in the new year. We keep acquiring companies and I keep having to learn about them. I just haven't had a chance to get to this. Now my demo pool is asking for the EX hardware that I'm using back, so I gotta knock these out. And lucky me, it's President's Day. Most people have the day off, I technically do, but I'm gonna use this to catch up on all these videos and hopefully close them out. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, pause the video so that you can see what we're gonna be doing here above me if you want. Uh, I can scroll that down just a bit. Uh, basic final tasks, I'm not gonna go through it line by line and we're just gonna tear into it. Uh, the first note that I have here is to check to make sure our PoE is enabled. I think my son might have walked into the room in the last video and I didn't get a chance to do that. Pretty straightforward. You can just do a show PoE and you can see, oh, sorry here, show configuration PoE. Uh, we can see where it's configured. It says interface all. And if we do show, hang on here, show PoE interface, I think we can do all. Can we do all here? Oh, we can just hit enter. It'll tell us if we're actually doing any power draw. I don't actually have anything plugged into this. It's going to draw power, so I'm not going to scroll all the way through. But those are the two configuration, uh, two commands, one for configuration, one for um, operational mode that you can use to verify that. Since we're going to be doing our cutover today, we need to set up our LACP uh, connection to our upstream gateway, in this case, an SRX firewall. I'm going to do this a little bit out of order because I want to show you one of the considerations when you're building a LACP bundle on an EX. Okay, so I'm gonna splice in the photo here and you're gonna notice on that LCD panel on the front that it has some alarms. And I'll show you, you know, we'll say clear alarms. There are some alarms you're gonna get until you add some configuration in. Uh, you might not need to, but I'll show you what those alarms are and how you can disable that. And it has to do with the management, out-of-band management interface that you're using on the back. So in it, it's zero and one you saw from the photo. Tricky with the this EX because that is a line card that I have installed. There are 40 gig ports on the back. So conventionally, if you're looking at the front, you might think that that first grouping of ports, 48 ports, it's going to be the slot zero. So it's zero slash zero. And then the neck, the cards would be zero slash one. But since it's a card, and since we have 40 gig ports on the back, it's zero slash two. Now you can always verify this by doing a run show chassis or just show chassis from operational mode, hardware. And here we can see FPC zero, and we can see pick zero is 48. Pick one is my four by 40, and pick two, if I have it installed, is my four by one gig, 10 gig uplink. So now we know the convention that we'll be using for the ports that I'm going to be uplinking to my firewall. So let's start there, edit, these are 10 gig, I think. So XC020, we'll do a dot zero because we can do that instead of typing in the word unit. Actually, we don't do that. I'm sorry, we're doing LACP. So we need to go here and all we do for the configuration on these two interfaces is we do a set gig ether options 802.3AD, which is the IEEE standard for LACP, and we marry it to an interface we're about to create, in this case, AE0 and we'll go up and we can actually just copy to 0 2 xe-021 so now we actually have to edit that ae interface so edit ae0 now we're going to set our black p ether options first uh, aggregate ether options and we need to do what are we doing here active p active periodic slow check your manufacturer recommendation the EX is perfectly capable of running fast periodic. I'd have to be using, I think, an EX2300, maybe the 3400 recommends slow. It just has to do with the amount of control signaling and just the horsepower under the hood. The SRX300 I'm using, we definitely recommend running periodic slow on. If I had a bigger SRX, it wouldn't be a problem, but that's why I'm doing this configuration. That's all we need for the aggregate configuration. Now we can get into the unit, so a edit unit zero. And we just do a set family ethernet switching interface mode trunk uh, vlan member and we'll just do all so if we go up one we can see the complete configuration here that we've added let's go right ahead and top commit and quit and then we'll look for our interfaces and we won't see them 
and that's why I've done it this way. I've left out a very important part because if you're new to Junos, this is something that might happen to you where you'll create this interface configuration and then you'll do a show interfaces terse and I'm gonna scroll through a bunch of stuff here. You can go all the way down and it should be here at the bottom and you'll see that it is not. We're looking for an AE interface and we do not see it. The reason we don't see it actually has to do with the show command we just used. Specifically, when you run that show command, it'll show you all the physical hardware interfaces that are on the device, including these ones down here at the bottom that are used internally for the most part. We don't see the AE interface here because if we were to show the AE interfaces that this device supports, it supports like 128, you'd be scrolling forever. So what we have is a mechanism for controlling the number of available AE interfaces, not for scale reasons, but so that you don't get into a scroll disaster. So what I need to do is go back into the configuration and go into chassis. I need to set aggregated devices, ethernet device count. And I recommend giving yourself a number here that will naturally be more than you think you'll need during the production lifetime of this device. You know, nobody needs to go in here and type 100, usually, not on a switch anyway. I'm just gonna put three. I only need one. I know this is a lab. Three to five is usually normal for these types of devices. While we're in chassis, we're also gonna hit this alarms thing. Run, show, pardon me, system alarms. You can see I've got output failure, not okay. This is just because I've been pulling power in and out of these things. It's really this management ethernet link being down and rescue configuration is not set. Since I'm in chassis, I can do a set alarm management ethernet link down ignore i'm not using the out of band management interface on this box and if you're not using it either you'll have to put this configuration in and then the rescue configuration here we can just do actually i guess at the end right now we can see right here that i've got the ae now it is not linked yet because i haven't moved the cables i'll do that here in a moment uh, let's see they're there uh, and let's just do a request uh, system configuration rescue oh, safe now show system alarms and this is just complaining because I do not have the second power supply actually plugged in right now. So it's detecting output failure, not okay. It's just complaining that I don't have it plugged in. Now we gotta set up our interface for our management. So that means we're gonna add a, an IRB uh, or an SVI if you're coming from iOS for our management VLAN. Show VLANs, I don't remember off the top of my head. So we just need to create an IRB and we also need to make it sticky to that management VLAN. So we make it sticky by doing set VLANs management, and then we add this in L3 interface and an IRB dot, you don't have to match the number of the VLAN ID, do it or it'll drive you nuts, uh, 1030. That IRB does not exist yet, so we're gonna have to go create it. IRB, my fingers, kind of cold in the, uh, the basement office today. 30, great, and we're already in the unit, so at this point we just set the family. Now since this is an IRB, you cannot set family ethernet switching. You have to do set family inet or inet6 or some other routed type interface, and then we'll just do DHCP, because I am going to be getting a DHCP address from my gateway. If I wasn't, I could set this manually here, and then I could do a static route. Static route is on the list here. I'll show you where to do that in a moment, but we're just gonna to try to get a DHCP address from the device, and I should get a default gateway. At this point in our process, it's time to patch our gateway into our EX4300. As you can see here, I'm just pulling the fiber out of the Cisco switch and moving the cables down to the EX. I would point out that when I do this in production, I generally plug the fiber into the transceiver before pushing it into the box, just preference. That way I'm actually not putting my thumb on the exposed end of the connector when I'm patching it in. You check for link light, ready to go. Let's see if that LACP interface came up. Let's just do a show interfaces terse AE0 to see if we're in an upstate. Oh, we're not. So hey, let's troubleshoot. It could be that these are gig interfaces and not 10 gig. In fact, that's plausible. So if that's the case, it's been a while, so forgive me for kicking the rust off. Uh, we should just be able to copy those over. So I don't know, we can actually even use the rename command or even better, let's be sneaky. Since we only have the two that are configured, the XE interfaces, the 10 gigs, I can do replace pattern XE dash with GE dash, and top show pair. And you'll see that I've 
kind of elegantly renamed the 10 gig to 1 gig. Now, these configurations could actually coexist at the same time, and the hardware is just going to pick up whichever one is actually relevant. But in this case, I'm just, I'm betting farm on it being that these are not 10 gig interfaces. So we'll see if that works. Hmm. Hmm. Ah, there we go. Pretty straightforward. I got onto the gateway and I can see that at some point I deactivated the specific interface that I need giving out DHCP. So we'll go ahead and activate that. There we are. Great. From this switch now, I should be able to ping to the public internet. And indeed I can. Now I mentioned earlier a static route. I obviously don't need it right now because I'm getting that from my DHCP server, but if you needed to configure one, you would do it here under routing options. And you do a set static route. And if it was default static, you could just do zero slash zero and then a next hop. And from here, put in whatever that gateway happened to be. What's left? Spanning tree, ah, oh, that's an easy one. Show protocols. We can see what we have enabled, RSTPs enabled. If you're coming over from Cisco, you might have been running PVST Plus. I'm not gonna cover interop, but just know that PVST Plus is proprietary. There are multiple spanning tree domains that can be defined. The default domain uses the standard multicast address for announcement messages, but all of the non-default realms for spanning tree do not. They use proprietary signaling, which means they won't work. So we have interrupt guides out there. If you need one, ask me in the comments or it's on our website. Uh, but just know that's a caveat. Uh, validation. So we've got some pies here. Uh, let's just make sure that they've got IP addresses as well. So uh, VNC into those. We'll jump into Pi 3. Hopefully this works because I was using these for a lab. <laughs> I have a secondary connection that I connected these with, so if this isn't working, it's not because they're not connected to the switch. It's because I need to unwind what I was doing in my lab before for the SD-WAN uh, POC that I was participating in. That's one we can log into. We can see here that uh, we have our IP address. This is what, in ETH0? Okay, so if config ETH0. There we go. 10.20.0.2. Perfect. That is our guest network. I know I said that I was going to do this management interface over here, but I just did it via DHCP. So we know that this handed out the .2 address, and we'll just point that out. Um, I can SSH to this box. <laughs> we'll deal with that in the next. Uh, oh yeah, uh, we'll deal with that in the next video where we do some hardening. But right now, this uh, this box is wide open to all the networks that are connected to it. So we can connect to it. We can ping. I think that wraps us up. Oh, wait, we've got to do our NTP. So I'm not going to test across all of these. I do know they work, and I obviously have to fix one of the pies so that I can actually get back to it on my uh, management network internally. I'll sort that out between now and the next video. Uh, we need to set our NTP server. So set system NTP, and I am going to use pool.ntp.org, which will just resolve to whatever name server happens to, it happens to spit back. Oh, there's that server, right? Uh, pool.ntp.org. It automatically resolves that. So if I go back and I look at uh, show NTP, you'll see that that IP address is here. This is a pool, so it can be different depending on time of day and when I run the command or I run it multiple times at the same, you know, in a row. It sometimes will spit back different addresses, which is why you need to have not only internet reachability but DNS as well. Show NTP status. You can see that we're connected. You can also do show NTP associations, and you'll see if you've actually got an association. So we're looking good. That's this video. We've only got a couple more left. You can see that I've got two hardening, and then we'll do the virtual chassis, and then I'm going to switch over to doing MIST, where we're going to import this brownfield virtual chassis into the MIST platform. And then, I don't know, probably nuke it, and then recreate the configuration in a greenfield deployment. Until the next video, which hopefully will be very soon, uh, I'll talk to you later. Any questions, comments down below? I like to... Spawn with videos, and that's how I generate my content. See you in the next one.